Dr. Venu. Good morning and welcome. I'm extremely pleased to open the proceedings of the summer school, which is an uh, old age tradition with the Venetian region. And the subject matter for this year edition is central. Indeed, we're going to talk about healthcare staff, healthcare systems, especially so with reference to skills and the development of healthcare systems. After the pandemics, sadly, a number of criticalities emerged in the all uh, healthcare systems, be them national, international, regional. Needs have changed, and our systems have to be flexible to adjust to them. in the shortest possible time. So as to fit with the changes that occur in terms of um, population age, of the composition of our communities. So we have to try and react at best in order for us to do so. Much reference is being made to IT technologies. Indeed, there's no conference meeting where artificial intelligence is not mentioned. And yet the human capital, i.e. the staff, the healthcare professionals, are certainly the main focus. Indeed, they are the starting point. And I believe the investment in them, in them professional skills and skills at large is all important nowadays, especially so because this is the hinge at the basis of all healthcare systems, uh, together with uh, important technologies uh, and uh, IT developments and innovations, uh, as well as all, all digital technologies. Uh, um, but again, staff and healthcare professionals uh, play a key role. Healthcare professionals, of course, have to be able to adjust to different situation, to the aging of population, to chronic businesses, uh, to uh, the increasing life expectancy, to issues that are ever more concerned, to mental health care as well. Uh, there are a lot of issues dealing uh, with the burnout, uh, with the stressful working conditions, as we know full well. And I believe uh, that uh, uh, this meeting being focused uh, on healthcare and professionals and staff is, again, very important. Uh, because, indeed, this is the main problem of healthcare systems. We have to give no way to provide motivation to our staff, uh, to make them feel uh, skilled and flexible diversifying their skills and adjusting to the different emerging needs. And I believe that this is true for all healthcare professionals uh, with no distinction being made. This is our main target. This is uh, the main support we can give uh, to provide better care to patients, uh, whether they are at home, whether they are at community facilities, hospitals, uh, wherever both for um, severely sick persons and less so. The Venta region is going to uh, identify a number of projects underway. These projects fit very well with the development underway. Indeed, we are trying to attach a greater importance uh, to community medicine uh, to get as close as possible to the home of patients and uh, to uh, get ever more comp competent healthcare staff. So I believe that uh, the discussion which is going to take place is going to provide a, good, a lot of food for thought. We're going to see the Best examples are to uh, heed. Certainly, we're not going through an easy situation throughout the healthcare world. And yet, we have to try and understand how care is important, uh, how patient management is important, how people are always central. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the proceedings. 
Minister, thank you so much for this very inspiring speech. And as a matter of fact, I think that what you said just resonated so much with what we are discussing in the summer school. And I, if I may say so, it almost sounded like you were part of the team designing this year's summer school because we have heard so many topics that we are really discussing in, in, in some depth. The agility of the health workforce, the adaptation, the flexibility. We've been talking about skill mix taken into account that demographic change, not only on side of the patients, but also on side of the health workforce, and that we react to it quickly. And not only firefighting is important, but we need to go a step further and we need to develop our health systems and the workforce with it. Thank you so much for this fantastic speech. And uh, as one, one, one more time, thank you so much for hosting us in this fantastic um, location. And this is the moment to say a couple of words about the summer school, what we are doing this for the people here in the room, but also for the online audience. I heard that almost 500 people has actually subscribed to uh, join today. And this year's topic is navigating the crisis. And we are looking at it from a, tw from a twin perspective, we say, of course, we have a current workforce crisis and we need to act very swiftly to, um, to address the crisis. We need to do the firefighting, but at the same time, we need to take a long-term perspective and we adjust the health workforce to new models of primary care in particular, in, in the hope that this will raise the performance. And the issues we are discussing in great depth is actually the performance of health systems and how the health workforce can contribute to it. We are talking about retention, which is what we need to do instantly. We need to keep the stuff we have, actually. We must not uh, lose uh, more people. We are talking about task shifting and skill mix because we firmly believe this is the way forward for a more efficient health workforce if we want to make more out of what we have at the moment. And of course, to make this all happen, we need to do the planning and forecasting. We have a session on it. We will have uh, in-depth discussion on planning methods and how we can um, better forecast the future needs. And if you know what we where we want to go and how we achieve this, we need to talk about the investment. There will be need for targeted investment in the health workforce. And last but least, I think that, as you say, it's almost unavoidable to talk about digital solutions and artificial intelligence. But we know that many of the digital solutions are actually facilitating a more efficient collaboration between health workers. So thank you so much. That was a very quick overview of what we are doing this year in the summer school. And this is for me the opportunity to um, invite uh, one of my co-directors this year. It's Thomas Zapata. He's regional advisor for human resources for health in WHO Europe. And uh, Thomas, I would like you to talk very briefly about one of the emphasis of this year's summer school, the collaboration between WHO and member states, how you help the member states. Please, Thomas. Thank you so much, Matthias. And before, I would like to pass the greetings from our regional director, Dr. Hans Kluge, to the minister, and our director of country policy and assistance, Natasha Sopardi-Muscat. Uh, so, Matthias, yes. So for us as WHO, first of all, we believe that health workforce is a critical pillar for health systems, as the minister said. And in that sense, we have also seen through our report, Health and Care Workforce in Europe, Time to Act, that we have a health workforce crisis, as we have seen in the, in the course during these days. And now, together with all 53 countries in the region, we develop a framework for action, which is really actionable, that is really focusing on how we can move forward and how we can improve implement solutions and really transform this crisis into a success so that we can support health systems. And to do that, WHO is fully committed, and actually we are doing it, in working together with countries in implementing the framework and implementing actions at the national level, going through analysis of the health labor market, going through rural retention, going through improving education, and many other things that we are doing with countries in really moving forward so that we can find together solutions to really strengthen our health systems and the health outcomes of the population. Thomas, thank you so much. Yesterday in the summer school, we had quite impressive testimonies, actually, how you work with the people in the countries and how you actually move forward um, the improvement of the health workforce. Kasha, it's my immense pleasure to invite you. Kasha, 
Kat uh, Bufskens is um, also a co-director this year. She is from the uh, European Commission, DG Sante. And Kasia, I would also like to ask you to um, fill us in a little bit on this particular relation, how you, how you help member states developing their health workforce. Kasia, you... Thank you, Matthias. And I would like also to thank the Minister for hosting us in this beautiful region which provides us really great working conditions, I must say. <laughs> and yeah, my reflection would be uh, on uh, the importance of the health workforce, workforce agenda uh, and our uh, EU uh, agenda. Of course, it features very prominently in what we are doing um, and developing our policies, policies which protect uh, the social model. And there would not be a social model without health, health workers. And uh, we may risk to see the erosion of um, this social model to which we are attached if we don't uh, step up our actions and support uh, member states uh, in solving the critical challenges they have. And of course we do a lot. Uh, we uh, develop policies which uh, uh, improve the working conditions uh, uh, of, of workers in Europe, also of course uh, our health workers through social dialogue, but also through targeted actions on skills uh, and labor shortages. We also have a policy mechanism which allows us to trigger the reforms um, to improve the resilience of health systems and to help health, health workers because they are at the core of, uh, of the concept of resilience. There, there are no resilient health systems without uh, strong health workers. So we have the European semester process. We try to trigger the reforms and to, to prioritize uh, the importance of, uh, of health workforce and linked to it we uh, provide uh, also a lot of funding instruments which member states can use according to their needs. And uh, in this summer school uh, we tried to help also uh, these uh, this excellent uh, students who came uh, to, to join the summer school to uh, look into the more innovative ways, ways of uh, um, resolving uh, uh, the problems we have because we cannot just talk about improving, uh, increasing the size of health workforce, we have to also look into the new solutions because uh, uh, just in increasing the size of health workforce is not feasible probably. Thank you. Kasia, thanks a lot for this and I think uh, many of us were impressed yesterday to see the overview on all the technical support instruments and the funding DG Sante is actually um, providing and is going to continue to provide. Very quickly, um, Thomas, because for the summer school, I think it's a kind of pivotal um, concept, health systems performance assessment. What, what, why are we talking about the, uh, the health workforce? I think it's because we want to increase the performance of health system. Please, Thomas. Thank you so much, Matthias. I think we had the session today exactly on health system performance assessment, and what we saw is the critical importance of health workforce in contributing to improve the performance. And in order to do that, one key element is to better have better data to better understand what are the health workforce challenges so that we can be better, more responsive to the concerns of the policy makers so that they can have take better policy decisions. So at the end of the day, it's about how we can have better evidence and to inform policy makers so that they can have and they can take better policy decisions. Thanks a lot, uh, Thomas. And Kasia, if I can come back to you and just give us a little bit of an insight into the dynamic. We do, do a lot of group work because it's not just all about theory, knowledge and data and so on, but we want to see that uh, some of this is really kind of practical and uh, we're doing a lot of group work. Give us some, some impressions from it. Yeah, I think uh, our impression is that uh, this uh, part of the program, uh, that all the participants enjoy it. They are uh, really working very hard uh, because we try to put the, the knowledge uh, to practice during the summer school. So uh, we included in our program some practical sessions. For example, yesterday our students worked on the leadership and governance framework. So they had to uh, solve, uh, uh, solve the crises in, uh, in health systems, um, but also more structural problems, for example, the problem of medical deserts in France or uh, the problem of uh, unsatisfactory working conditions in Portugal. So I think they, they had a lot of fun yesterday. And today, uh, today it was more serious because it was about the data. 
Uh, so I think it was also interesting, and they did very well, but because they understood very clearly uh, what are the shortcomings of data, but also what they can do with the data to push for, for good policies. So there is uh, also a lot to come, but I think I will keep it secret. So uh. Thank you. Thank you, Kasia. It may sound a little bit strange to talk about it in terms of a lot of fun, but on the other hand, I think that we in the meantime quite agree that we need to adopt a positive view, you know, and not always use negative language, but rather see what are the positive options, how do we move out of the problems, how do we show a perspective where the light is at the end of the tunnel. And now, it's my immense pleasure to introduce my dear colleague, Chris Brown, who is our leader, WHO here in Venice. Actually, Chris, you are heading actually the WHO Venice office for many, many years in the meantime. And it's very, very happy. <laughs> Nobody sees that. And it's very, and we are very happy to have you here today. Please, Chris. Yes. And it's delightful to be here. Um, and thanks very much to the minister. It's great to be, to be uh, working together. I mean, I think the summer school is a, un is a unique uh, place for a different type of learning. And I think this issue uh, that we're talking about today in terms of the health workforce is absolutely critical. Um, in fact, it's been part of the work of the Venice office for 20 years uh, with the collaboration with the Veneto region, initially in the Verona initiative, now after 20 years of celebrating recently, um, the issue of health workforce uh, and collaboration with Veneto on this area is super important. What's key is that today, the health sector is in the top 10 sectors of the economy in every one of our countries. And it's because of the health workforce, the employment, the commissioning. But at the same time, we're facing both the democratic, demo, demographic challenges as well as workforce challenges. And let me give you some of the things that I think are going to be discussed later on today. So, We've got an aging population. What that means is there's going to be three over 65 for every two younger person in the workforce. That means that long-term care is increasing. That's going to create 140, uh, 184 million new jobs in the long-term care sector in the next 10 years. Young people's mental health. If young people are going to be supercharged to, to protect our economies and our societies in the years to come, we should be worried that 60% of them report low mental health and 50% of them report unmet need to access mental health services. And that's an issue to do with health workforce and innovation. And our rural, rural urban areas, we have 600 excess deaths in rural and left behind areas because of lack of access to health services and poor economic development. So addressing the health workforce, innovations in it, whether through technology and new methods of de development is absolutely key to these challenges. I just want to say two things. One um, thing, Chris, one thing. we need to speed up, please. The Venice office is actually working with countries. We're working with uh, 41 uh, regions in 26 countries to support implementation of human resources for health plans, budgets and investment case and working with 11 small countries to help them. All of them have developed um, human resources for health plans. Thanks for working with colleagues at the Observatory, the EU, and our colleagues here in WHO. So thanks very much, Matthias. Chris, thank you so much. And if I was talking quite fast, it was because Annalisa told me, Matthias, you need to hurry up. We need to close a little bit earlier. But we still have enough time if the minister wants to have uh, one more uh, last word, and uh, before we close this welcome panel, you're most welcome to address the audience another time. Non ho molto da aggiungere rispetto ai saluti iniziali. There's not much I wish to add to what I said earlier on. I believe that I understand that there is one common red thread in focusing our attention on professionals so as uh, to enhance uh, skills and flexibility within healthcare systems, uh, be them at community or hospital levels. I believe we should uh, try and protect at best professionals so that uh, they never feel abandoned, uh, but uh, feel as a part of a well-organized systems uh, 
I believe that healthcare professionals need to feel protected. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. Thank you for your time. Thank you for hosting us and for your very important words. And thanks to my co-directors and to Chris Brown for joining for today. And um, now we actually already come to the second panel. And, you know, we bring to the summer school really, really excellent faculty. We, take, we, we really take this super, super serious that we have the best of the best. But in reality, the most important asset the most important resource is our students because we learn a lot from each other. The knowledge they bring to the table and the experience and the exchanges we can facilitate are amazing. So learning from each other is really the theme of the summer school. And now we are here to learn from each other again. We want to learn from Veneto. And it's not a lip service. We've done this before. Actually, at like I think it was 11 years ago, a three-partite policy dialogue between Slovenia, Austria, and the region of Veneto on the development and implementation on primary care reforms. And it was actually on the day that the Austrian parliament was passing the primary care law. And um, we always turn to Veneto for primary care developments, and we are very keen to hear about health workforce developments as well. And I'm really very happy to um, invite Claudia Costa, Director of Human Resources, Regional Health Service, Veneto Region. And Claudio will talk about family and community nurses, something which is really of highest relevance for us and for the summer school. Claudio, the floor is all yours. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, before starting, uh, allow me to make a point. As Matthias said, uh, and I think also uh, Thomas, uh, um, the main challenge, my opinion, the main challenge in the future is the retention of health professionals. Because the professionals are leaving the profession at an alarming rate, and we cannot be attractive uh, if we cannot retain. So retain, retain, and retain is the main challenge in the future. Uh, it's a pleasure to finally meet some colleagues from the observatory here from WHO, whom I have been following for a long time, and uh, from who, whose work uh, we have drawn and draw many insights and ideas uh, for our work uh, on health workforce organizational models, and so on. Matthias, in particular, Joseph Figueras, the director, and Thomas Zapata, obviously. Allora, in 15 minuti vi presenterò... So in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to share with you the organizational model for family and community nursing that has been set up to grant community services in healthcare facilities of the Venice region. Let me start with a number of uh, data. Italy, together with Japan, rank at the top in terms of um, countries or with the uh, um, oldest population. And indeed, uh, there's very, uh, as a very strongly aging population, uh, people are living longer and are giving birth to ever less children. There are as many as 14 million over 65 years, with 20,000 people uh, above 100 years. Uh, and as of 1st of January 2022, the uh, uh, old age index, uh, which correlates, as you know, the population between 0 and 14 years with the over 65, well, that correlation is equal to 108%. Over the past 20 years, it grew by 56 points. The Veneto rate uh, is slightly higher than the um, Italian average, uh, 195. And we believe uh, that in 1942, it will be as high as uh, um, 293, 293 uh, uh, over 65. Uh, 
compared uh, to, zero, to the number of uh, um, children between 0 and 14. The consequence of this uh, aging index uh, is the um, correlated increase in the name of chronic diseases with an important commitment in terms of um, social and economic resources. An analysis carried out on the elderly people monitoring the prevalence of chronic diseases has pointed out to the fact that 53.7% of the population in the Veneto region with more than 65 years of age has at least one chronic disease, while 20.3% uh, uh, have two or more chronic diseases. Let's have a look at the stratification of um, patients uh, based on the risk index according to the regional healthcare plan. In our model of patient management for chronic diseases and multimorbidity based on chronic care intensity, a distinction has been made in two levels of chronicity, the simple chronicity and complex advanced chronicity. By simple straightforward chronicity, affecting some 40% of the population, we find the people in adult age or, or mm, children with one single disease or non-complex conditions, chronic conditions, as well as a patient with non-chronic complex uh, multiple diseases. The complex chronicity and advanced chronicity have affect some 4% of the population and refers uh, to a com situation of a multi severe multimorbidity as well as a terminal patients. In the eventual healthcare system, care for advanced and complex patients is granted by multidisciplinary teams that um, provide their services at the home of the patient, whereas uh, a simple chronicity patients are cared for by multi-professional teams in primary care And that care is granted by um, primary care medicines, but nurses are not included. Nurses, indeed, could grant uh, assistance and care to a uh, chronic patient, and this is very important to grant engagement of patients in managing their disease. There are associations of doctors and nurses, uh, but they're not uh, uniformly distributed in the region. In 2022, a ministry decree was adopted whose focus was that of the reform of community services in healthcare after the adoption of the national Italian plan for resilience and recovery. So we have an area to develop which is that uh, concerning the uh, complex chronic patient. In the case of simple chronicity, Patient management actions are involved, uh, as well as uh, proactive measures. There are a number of initiatives that are to be taken for the management of these chronic patients. The strategies for, to tackle chronic diseases should consider what are the needs of the patients, what is the trend of the disease, and should be different based on the features of the patient uh, with the different teams of doctors and nurses being involved. The main requirements of patients with a simple chronic is a self-management, which implies that these people have to understand what their health requirements are, are to be guided and informed as to the services available, these patients have to learn to self-monitor themselves, to manage their patient administration, to use new devices, and oftentimes the family members who adjust to new life situations to understand where complications might arise and to accept the new condition, the new health condition, and the new living conditions of their family member. Internationally, there is a 
profile available, which is that of family and community nurse. The question that I would like to voice is as follows. Are the skills of this nurse adequate for the management uh, of patients with chronic diseases? And the answer is in the positive, of course. And uh, the skill profile, as defined by the European project Enhance, dating back to 2020-2021, um, has a reinforced that. We have guidelines as drafted by the Conference of Italian Regions in 2020 has already identified what are the requirements for these nurse and also the allied professional associations has identified again the profile of the family and community nurse. Our target is matching the requirements with the uh, human resources available. For this model to be adopted for the family community nursing, a work group has been established in spring 2023 that included medical doctors, nurses, at community and university levels. The team has analyzed the existing legislation, the experience that has been carried out in our local health. We've looked at the requirements in terms of health as to come up with a professional organizational model that was then adopted with a decree by the original parliament. The document includes two parts. A fir one first part is devoted to the professional and organizational models, and the second has to do with the uh, planning of regional education with one approach, uh, with one specific target, i.e. family and community nursing for all the nurse, you know, nurses that have to deal with um, complex and simple um, chronicity at community level. Some um, 200 nurses that, that are already operational. At the same time, we've also established um, a discussion with the universities that train um, family and community nurses with a master course with the associations of the allied professionals and the trade unions. The ministerial decree established again the family and community nurse um, profile, but never said uh, what was the target in terms of population. It referred to one nurse per 3,000 inhabitants. This was what the law laid down. But as a matter of fact, not all nurses uh, can, not all 1,800 nurses are working in the region could work as a family and community nurses because we know that family and community nurses need to be specially trained. Uh, and this uh, training is uh, something which is administered after the first university course. So it is only a uh, um, uh, postgrad master course that can train uh, a family and community nurse. So you cannot grant this same training training for all the eight, uh, 1,800 staff, so there is a model that we have been defined. So we have uh, uh, one nurse, uh, which has a specific uh, training for the management of primary um, care, public health, uh, family and community, um, and uh, it has to act as the family community nurse. It has, uh, this, um, this nurse should have had a, ma a master course after the basic graduation and works as a consultant for the other members of the team. So services have been established that are called, again, as you see in the acronym, which is Service of uh, Family and Community Nurses. Mm. And there are also regular nurses that have received an additional regional course for simple chronicity patients that do not require home care, um, which is only targeted for um, different situations. So according to our model, we have a community uh, facility 
which is to be found um, across the, the community granting these uh, services. At the beginning, we believe that we might have one specialized nurse per each um, hub. There are as many as a hundred nurse, a hundred community hubs. with a special training um, and 15 more um, receiving regional training. And we've decided to have a specific training for all these nurses uh, that are going to act as family community nurse in the family community nursing setting. What are the skills of the family community nurse? Well, there are four main skills, i.e. Mm, skills in the clinical practice for families and communities, uh, with skills also in terms of leadership and management. As members of a team, they have to be also be able to provide training for the single patients and their relatives. And they should also be able to carry out the research and to refer to other specialized doctors. Uh, so the um, service and the family and community nurse should take care of the patients with high level of vulnerability in the family, their family settings. So these are patients that require specialized, trained nurses. And they should be able also to promote a stable health care. And these uh, specialized nurses should provide the training to the other members of the team. They are going to do so either directly or by means of telemedicine tools. In this slide, you see the target of family community nursing. So we have already referred to simple chronic patients matching these inclusion criteria. So um, eligibility for the patient management with uh, um, treatment and diagnostic path of chronicity uh, that do not, that are incapable of uh, providing self-care and that are considered as vulnerable with an age exceeding 65 years. Uh, Our model for the family community nursing service by means of a network of connection obviously implements the continuity of care among the social and medical departments interacting with the social and health care facilities. We want to make sure that uh, these uh, staff is managed um, with flexibility, uh, granting the appropriateness uh, of the competent skills. Uh, what are the main results we expect? What do we expect from uh, the Family and Community Nursing Service? Well, we do expect an enhancement uh, in uh, the um, compliance of patients, improvement of their quality of care, the reduction in the use of the hospital uh, and a better connection between uh, community services. Uh, but a challenge from which we cannot avoid. Thank you for attention. Claudio, thank you so much for this. This has been profoundly impressive because I think this is almost like a textbook example of innovating and transforming the health workforce. You have really started with trying to profile the population. What are actually the health problems we are confronted with? You are prioritizing certain problems. And then in the next step, you wonder what sort of competencies are actually necessary to address them. And then you go and think about what professions do we need to, to do this? And the next step, you do the planning uh, and, and forecasting, actually, and uh, you change the educational curricula, and you embed all this in your um, primary care 
model. Fantastic. I wish for all of the countries it would be so straightforward as for you. I think it's a very important example and I think it's also super, super encouraging. And I think I can figure that many of you have questions. I think we have time for a round of questions and also um, Jada, if there are um, questions coming through the chat, uh, please back. Who wants to take the floor first? I see Vesna already here. Yes, <laughs> nervous. I... Thank you very much. I'm coming from Slovenia and we are doing something very similar in our primary health care. But the problem is where to get the new nurses. So we have lack of professionals there. And for example, what happened by us was that we invited nurses uh, registered, so diploma nurses, into the primary health care to do all this wonderful job. And then we realized that they are coming from intensive care. So suddenly we had two little nur nurses in, uh, in, you know, intensive care, which is not okay, we all know. So how are you dealing with this? Very good. Maybe we collect another two questions before, Claudio, you respond to it. Yes, please. Introduce yourself. Fatima Sekhan from Sweden. Uh, my question is about the aging population that you talked about and uh, also the cognitive challenges among this population. And your approach requires that they cognitively can uh, cooperate with the healthcare professional. So how do you deal with that? Thank you so much. And uh, one more question from the floor. Oh, no, this was the cameraman. Okay. <laughs> No, if not, uh, yes, please. Yeah, I'm Goran Zenkan, I'm based in Scotland. Uh, I was wondering, I mean, you talked about the legal framework and the uh, wider context a little bit, but I was wondering if you could touch a bit on the, the uh, uh, groups, patient groups, civil society organizations, other interest groups that might be uh, in, in interested, other stakeholders in the, in the reform. Very good point, thank you so much. Um, Claudio, what about Vesna's question? Um, how to make sure that the numbers add up, you know, and that you are not cannibalizing your hospitals if you get them into primary health care? As I said earlier on, we can only rely on the people we have. At community level, we have as many as 1,800 nurses that are somewhat involved in the patient management for chronically, chronic patient, a simple chronic patient. The family and community nurses that have received a master course are already part of our staff and our health unit has already identified the nurses who are best suited to work at community and family level. But we cannot hide the fact that over the next few years, we in Venice region, we in Italy, us uh, in Europe perhaps, will all be affected by a remarkable lack in nurses. So the problem with healthcare um, systems over the next few years is not going to be so much that of the shortness of doctors, uh, medical doctors, it is going to be a most severe lack of nursing staff. As for the subject of the second question, i.e. the challenge of education and training, well, one of the main skills of uh, um, the family community nurses is indeed uh, that of being able to involve and train the patient. And we're talking about self-sufficient patient, a patient that can uh, self-treat themselves, that can be empowered, that can comply, um, can, that, that can develop compliance. We know that one of the most important problem is the lack of compliance of chronic patients. So I believe that one of the most important skills ahead of us for um, community nursing is that of education, training, um, empowerment of the patients themselves, of chronic patients. As to the third question, well, of course, family community nurses won't be able to do any to task. We have identified one specific task and not to disperse the staff available. So we have guided um, our nurses to treat chron simple chronic patients. 
family and community nurses in the near future are going to be able to, again, use all the resources at community level. So indeed, we are uh, very much focused on community being involved as well, members of the community being involved. So we wanted to leverage on the, on the help that can come from um, everybody within the community to perform social health care. I think this is something also about uh, civil society involvement, social participation. I guess that uh, over the course of the summer school, we will talk about this as well. Jada, did we have any question coming through the chat box? Sorry. Yes. So first of all, I want to say we have a truly global audience joining from uh, Canada, Malawi, the Bahamas. So we have a variety of questions, but I think one that is uh, um, pertinent to what Dr. Costa just presented. Um, one person was interested in seeing if uh, when you looked at the collaboration between universities to revise the curriculum, were there very gaps in terms of competencies that you had to address? The answer is yes. In the Italian training model, the uh, master uh, regulations are uh, very liberal. So universities can decide upon the subjects. We uh, have an agreement with the University of Padua um, which has a hundred years of history, and the University of Verona, who train our nurses, um, they have a master course uh, for uh, family and community nursing in the two universities. And uh, we agreed on the topics of the master course, adjusting that to our model. This is what we did. On top of that, at national level, there is a reform of master courses. Now, uh, nurses study for three years. They have a bachelor and they have a degree enabling them to perform the profession, plus two master years, which mainly concern management and research. Uh, there is a reform and the way concerning the master courses so that some of them can be um, clinical. There are three of them and one will concern family and community nursing. The, another one concerns uh, pediatrics and the third uh, is on intensive care. Super. Thank you so much, Claudia. Claudia. This was a really great presentation and it was spot on for our summer school. It's exactly the topics we need to talk about. And also, thank you so much for being very frank in your responses to the questions. I know some of them are hard nuts to crack and uh, even though you have already made a lot of advances, not everything is easy to, to fix, but it was really absolutely great. Thank you so much and a big clap of hands for Claudio, please. And now, it's my great pleasure to invite Lisa Leonardini, taking the floor, Technical Coordinator, Promise Veneto Region. And the title of um, Lisa's uh, presentation is Regional Experiences of the General Strategy for Upskilling the Digital Competences of the Healthcare Professionals. And I'm so happy that you talk about this because um, we've been also talking about it in the summer school as digital and green skills. And when Gemma and me, we were preparing this, we thought, uh, probably it doesn't really resonate with the people, but we had a poll and it was pretty high up on the agenda. And this is following actual folk group inter interviews Gemma and me and colleagues did in countries. And some of the countries, I don't name the country, it's a big country I'm coming from. The healthcare leadership was very blunt and said, we have all the technology, but we have neither the money nor the time to train the people to use it in meaningful ways. Please, Lisa, fill us in. È spento, ora lo accendo. <laughs> Grazie a tutti per l'invito. È molto interessante. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Thank you very much, Matthias, for your words. 
uh, as far as uh, technologies are concerned. We are speaking about changing health systems. It's important to know that in this change, human resources and the workforce are a key element in that change. They have to be motivated to the change and they have to help reorganizing healthcare systems. They are indeed in the front line. They are those who use the uh, new technologies which are used in the process of change. Uh, let me make a step backward. I work for PROMIS. PROMIS is an international program on health. It's a national program uh, which has been operational for 14 years with a coordination of the Veneto region. We are the coordinators of the PROMIS program, so we are happy to be able to coordinate many initiatives and the workforce in the Veneto region. So much so that we invested a lot in the uh, planning of the 23-25 two years, um, concentrating on the workforce. We have an online platform with a session devoted uh, to a workforce. We are in charge of uh, making healthcare systems getting international. So we are there to involve all the people working in Italy, the Ministry of Health, the Consortium Agenus, and all the uh, health uh, uh, system agencies i.e. those people who are in the front line. They have to be involved and they have to be given the tools uh, to get to know what's going on internationally, what's going on in Europe, what are the practices that we can both export and import, because, you know, you can always learn continuously. One of the promise initiatives which we stimulated is that on workforce. In uh, 2020, together with the representatives of the Ministry of Health and uh, Agenas, a consortium uh, and the Department for Digital Transformation and Italian regions and provinces, we all attended um, the opportunity or uh, make use of the opportunity uh, to work in this uh, uh, subject. We have a flag on digital skills in particular, and we propose a project to uh, develop a number of deliverables which could be useful uh, in Italy to improve digital skills of the health workforce in an integrated way. We did that in order to uh, turn that strategy into practice into the different regions. In Italy, it, the regions are those who manage social and health uh, services and uh, the workforce as well. Um, there are three deliverables in particular. Two of them are uh, closely connected. One is the uh, e-health uh, uh, report, we want to be in synergy with other programs of the um, fund given by the European Union uh, to strengthen the use of the health record. We have a strategy for communication and uh, uh, training on the health uh, EF uh, record in order to uh, learn how to use it uh, in the primary and the secondary uh, sector. There is another deliverable, is that of the national strategy on digital upskilling. Uh, we are uh, fully collaborating and have co-designed with regions and autonomous pro uh, provinces. We wrote, and sorry, I forgot uh, to uh, mention the associations of the uh, healthcare professionals, because we want to take on board all the uh, stakeholders. So we uh, have developed a strategy so that we can have continuous learning in medicine and nursing so that is connected with the accreditation tools. We also created a tool in that strategy so that we can identify uh, the perfect digital skill based on the profession one is uh, implementing um, with relation to the age of the professional and the role they play. 
we have many uh, aging persons in the workforce and so they have uh, to have a different approach to the use of technologies. We have developed uh, a matrix uh, to define the perfect digital world so a professional autonomously can make a self-assessment of the, their knowledge in terms of digital skills so that they can identify the gaps Within the same strategy, uh, together with the regions, we have defined a portfolio of digital skills. Uh, uh, there is an action plan which will uh, help us to implement the idea. There are three pilot regions uh, to make the uh, experiments. After that, the three uh, regions will be involved to create an infrastructure so that the strategy can take roots in all Italian regions. I uh, didn't follow um, my slides, but indeed you can visit the website. Uh, I came here to tell you about the process and to tell you something about the future. There is a next step lasting 10 months for the experiments. In mid-25, we will be in a position to talk about the outcomes and how to implement them in the other regions. In, uh, we have, you know, a, a controlling uh, centre uh, with the Ministry of Health, uh, uh, Agenes, the uh, Higher Institute of Health and the Department for Digital Transformation and that control centre will work with us so that we can define a national strategy on the general skills for healthcare professionals, i.e. strategy for the works of force uh, for social and healthcare services. So the deadline uh, is October, um, that is the European one. Before that, there is the national a deadline in September and we will be able to define a wider strategy. The idea is to create synergies with other programs. We are strongly collaborating with agents in the framework of joint actions concerning the, work, the workforce and the needs. We are members of the coordination team with the Ministry of Health. We are there to assist and we want to indeed connect that part uh, to the uh, work we are doing on partnership. That's it. Thank you very much. This and I think we cannot underestimate how important it is to not only have a digital infrastructure to support primary health care, but also to use it in a way which is not replicating the old ways of working, you know, where you really transform the service and service delivery. So you don't need to convince me of the digital skills strategies, I'm fully with you, but I was always very curious to hear how do you get the skills actually in the system, you know, how do the, you get them to the, to the health professionals? And I understood from your presentation that continuous professional development is one of the major instruments, you know, to make this happen. And this is actually, unfortunately, laying its fingers on another wound in many of our health systems because the continuous professional development systems in many countries are not so good at the moment, you know. And this is the way forward because we are changing the skills, the profession so quickly. We need to adapt to the ever changing population and population needs. And I think we need to use this instrument much, much more um, systematically. Can I ask a couple of people for, for questions, please? Three questions we can take. Who goes first? Do I need to point at somebody? <laughs> oh, there's someone. Oh, yes, of course. Please, Alexander, in, introduce yourself. Yes, my name is Alexander. I also come from a bigger European country that doesn't seem to have time to introduce um, digital learning skills in its basic curriculum. It's also a country which has 16 lender, 16 regional entities. Um, you have 25 regions. Um, how is it? Hmm? Less. Okay. Well, you've got you've got you've got many reasons, uh, many regions. Um, how how are you going to manage to keep these approaches, these projects that you have in line, so you have like a fairly uniform curriculum, a fairly uniform approach to teach um, digital skills in Italy? 
This is actually a super smart question which goes beyond digital because I think it is really very important for many federal or decentralized countries which have maybe not so strong diversified health systems but still quite some, some diversity and different governance structure. Please, Lisa. È una bella domanda, in effetti. A jolly good question. Indeed, the, the process is very uh, complex because there are many regions in Italy and they are uh, different. And also their level of uh, technology adoption is different. So there are diff differences in technology and in organization. I forget to tell you that digital is a tool but as a matter of fact, you need the right culture to implement the digital element which makes the process more efficient. And human resources are key there. Uh, when preparing the project, we involved a, a person uh, uh, of reference per each region. They are, have been appointed and we asked the um, local ministers to involve the right people for each region because we need a person in charge of that, uh, in charge of human resources and training. And uh, Dr. Costa is the coordinator. We also have um, a body, a, a table where we can meet, it's a healthcare commission, dealing with those subjects. So uh, in the Veneto region, we can convey the information much more clearly through the coordinator of that forum, of that table. Uh, we try to involve uh, the highest number of people possible and in reviewing the strategy, in defining the governance which have to be implemented and the types of healthcare professionals which have to be involved and the n new skills needed, we had a discussion comparing the different levels. Uh, so the strategy have to be set into its background. The different regions uh, will have different models of governance with a common basis, but they have to be tailored to the different regions. This is a process, I, I, I didn't tell that we have accomplished or reached the end of the process. I have another question. Yes, please. Fatima from Sweden. I'm curious about the challenges of retainment of health uh, workforce and uh, when you, how do you uh, uh, maintain the digital skills level in an acceptable uh, manner uh, over time? That's a difficult question. When you use the matrices that we created, I, uh, they are complex indeed. We defined, you know, considering the role of a person in their organization, so from the lowest uh, one to the uh, top management, we uh, indicated the needs or the uh, digital skills which are needed. When we cross uh, that element with age, we were uh, able uh, to quantify um, the fact that some people are really very important, uh, those who are in the top and that have to remain in the system, uh, but they don't have the time or the ability to improve their digital skills. So it's just uh, crossing and aligning skills, competencies, age, uh, and role, that's complex. It's a challenge, but it's a way to retain staff because that gives them the opportunity to fill the gap. So the, the professional, and the, the, the single person, um, can identify the gaps to be filled. Then the managers decide where to invest, in which skills they have to invest, and they decide to allocate money. And so the, this is the basis for retaining people. Do we have uh, questions coming through the chat box? Yeah, I, I will take this on. So I'm, I'm Gemma from the Observatory, the London Hub. Um, I think we've had sort of a few people in the chat as well, sort of quite interested in the future perspective of sort of your work and what you're doing. 
Um, and I think in particular, they're sort of wondering sort of to what extent your work sort of is looking at not just upskilling the existing workforce, but sort of are you map, starting to map out some of the new and emerging roles that might be needed in Italy? Um, so, for example, cyber security experts. Is this sort of part of your thinking, part of your planning? And do you have any sort of particular roles that you're sort of really emphasizing going forward? Grazie, sì. Questo... Indeed, we, we have taken that on board. And that is part of the second phase. It includes the implementation of the strategy, but also uh, the planning of a wider national strategy on the workforce. So we are uh, considering the idea of new roles uh, hinging between the two things, as Dr. Costa said, and also the idea of mixed skills i.e. exploiting some professions to do other roles. That should be part of a wider strategy, which is uh, under construction, as it were. Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you um, once again, Claudio, and thank you so much, Minister, for hosting us and for speaking to us. I think it was really a great session, and um, really in terms of learning from each other, I think we all take home a couple of very important things. Um, I'm closing this session five minutes ahead of time and I would like to ask you all to return from the coffee break five minutes earlier because we were asked to leave the venue a little bit earlier and here's a message to Joseph. Joseph, please don't use the five minutes I was saving, you know, for your panel. <laughs> so, thank you so much. A big clap of hands, show of hands for all our fantastic speakers and the panels. And see you back at 5.10. People online are back uh, in their own breaks. Sorry they cannot be here and enjoy the canal and the uh, beautiful hospitality that we always have when we are in Veneto. I believe my panelists are here and on time. So welcome participants, welcome Veneto colleagues and welcome those online. What do we want to do in this last session today? We've been talking in the, in the summer school, we were talking a lot in the field of uh, health workforce policy around the four R's, the four R's of where's Thomas Tapata that Doble just put on the table. The recruitment, recruitment strategies, the retaining, second R, the reskilling and task shifting, and I like to our at a fourth R, the redistribution, the medical deserts, the migration, and so on. And we've been talking a lot about the policy strategies, we've been talking about best practices, we've been talking about assessing performance, incentives, planning, investing, education. Hello? Yeah. What I'd like to do now with this excellent panel is talk about implementation and transformation. I'd like to talk about the political economy of change. We love to use that word, and many of us don't understand what it means, but it's, it's cool, right? Political economy. It's the political economy, Lynn, right? Isn't it? Exactly. What does it mean? I'll tell you. Thank you. It wasn't prepared, this thing. Totally spontaneous. <laughs> it wasn't prepared. It's about power about the distribution of power between these actors. Have you ever heard that doctors have more power than nurses in some countries? That some specialists have more power than others? Okay, help me here. What's the best specialist to influence the Minister of Health? Wow, how did you know that? The next one. And, and that becomes messy. The urologist. Many ministers, prime ministers, are males and have problems with the prostate. So, you know, the power of the urologist is enormous. 
I'll leave it here. What are you thinking about, Katja? Careful here, careful, careful. We are getting into a complex uh, uh, territory. Seriously, it's the power, it's, it's the culture, it's the tacit knowledge that these have, it's, it's, it's the influence, and of course, it's the socioeconomic and political context, which as we'll hear from our participants, from our panelists rather, is extremely, extremely important to understand those socioeconomic contexts within which our reforms are taking place. We need, we need to talk about stakeholder analysis, we need to talk about communication, empower, empowerment, leadership, and so on and so forth. And that's exactly, panelists, where I'm like, I'd like to hear from you today. We do have an excellent panel, and I know every time we start a panel we say we have a privilege, really excellent panel, but this time it's true. We do really have an excellent panel. We are really, really lucky. They're all civil servants. They're all senior civil, civil servants. If you look at their backs, they have many scars. Many scars in the member states implementing reform, transforming, and the servants of the people, Doblet, Joe, and the Commission, yes, all of you, have many scars in the transformation, in the implementation, in the politics. And of course, there are some limitations of how much I can ask them about how they got these scars and their experience. I'm stopping it, don't worry. You gave me 10 minutes, Vesna. This, to work with the same person so many years is very difficult, you know. She looks at me like, you know, my wife, <laughs> controlling me. <laughs> Seriously, now, we are very lucky because they'll be able to tell us about the actual aspects that we want to learn about, these transformation elements. And I expect, and I'll stop talking in a second, that you will be doing the same and those online the same. I really want to talk about politics, change, implementation. We know an awful lot, because look, skill mix. For how many years we know that nurses are bloody good at prevention and prescribing from chronic patients? It's not rocket science. Why is it not happening? Power, culture, incentives. About recruiting. No rocket science. By the way, this is rocket science here, and this is where I like us to start, colleagues. You know that the fertility ratio, the replacement rates now, I was looking at the recent data, are well under replacement rate in North America, in Europe, just about replacement rate in Asia, and only the only continents above that is in Africa. So the main political economy factor is, guys, you have to have more babies. That's the reality. If we don't have more babies, we need to think about other areas. There is this statistic that's been mentioned a lot, that in Germany, one of every three kids is born today needs to work in the social and the health sector. Somehow that's not good for the economy, right, Marco? No. No, no, we cannot have all of them in the social. So we need to think about other strategies to deal with that crisis. And in those strategies for recruitment, for reskilling, uh, for retaining, there are many, many elements of political economy we need to talk about. Okay, so if that's okay for the servants of the people, I will start from the member states, the clients. Let me start with Vesna. You knew I was going to start with you. Seriously, Vesna. Vesna, Vesna Petric, uh, Kirsten Petric is, is someone, now I'm going to be more serious, with enormous experience. Uh, Vesna has been Director General. She's now the head of the, of the WHO office in the Ministry of Health in Slovenia. She's been recently uh, the chairperson of the executive board of WHO. And she's the kind of person that knows the work in member states. She's been behind lots of implemented, implementing policies, many of them with health workforce, and also has been working very closely with the WHO and the European Commission. Vesna, in transformation terms, what is your wish list? What do you want these individuals here, and I'm sorry about the gender balance in this panel, it's not reflective of the gender balance of the trainers of the uh, summer school, and definitely not within the observatory, which are very, we are very much gender balanced, but I'm sorry we are not in this panel. Vesna, can you give us a sense of what do you want, particularly in areas such as skill mix, what kinds of support you need in the reforms in your country, uh, the health workforce, that uh, these gentlemen, these institutions can help you with? 
Thank you. It's a great question, and I'm with you. We need to have more babies, but it's not on me. I'm too old. Uh, but yes, more babies. In fact, we need to more capable people at all levels, and I'm going to say something about this. What are our expectations for, from international organizations? Is the sound okay? It's me. Yeah? Like this? Okay. Um, uh, we've done a lot in the recent years. You were speaking today of challenges, but also on innovations. A lot of innovations have been produced already in pilots that were financed by international community and supported by WHO, Observatory, and some other international institutions in the countries. We have piloted, for example, how to introduce um, different ways of working in primary health care, preventive services, this and that. And we were successful. But forgive me, now it is on us countries. All these investments that were there for us, possibility was there for us to use, uh, you know, funding from the Commission, for example, European Commission, gave us some results. And now we have to systemize this because health will not forever be priority on the international agenda. So we have now to cope with all this innovation and to consider how best to implement in the country. For this, sometimes we need support, but where is the problem? The problem is when you want to systemize, you need somebody this, that it is in charge. And what we often miss at the ministries of health is competent people that could do the job. So if we are speaking of the workforce, we would need not just a unit on workforce that is dealing with you know, people coming into the countries and needing licenses and so on, but that would be capable of forecasting, planning, evaluating, taking in account that here, is, um, here are new um, uh, things that are coming like digitalization, how to put it in the system, not to overburden health professionals, we, it was so promising, but actually it's also adding to the burden to health professionals. How to do, deal with people that became suddenly different and more demanding because they have all this information on the web, you know? And doctors and nurses now have to deal with this differently. So we need, we need to start with better training and skill mix at the ministry exactly. on the governance side. Exactly. So we need to begin Down there. The, at the head. So how do we do that? It's, I guess to attract people working in the ministry, sometimes in some countries with lousy salaries, it's rather difficult. We need to have incentives as well to have more planners, policy, policy not high level civil servants, as you, civil servants as you are, to try to steer and to govern, right? I mean, it's not only about money. I'm a medical doctor. I have worked in the Ministry of Health for 30 years. So obviously, I'm not staying there because you know of the salary. Uh, but because are you exception to the rule, or, or you are the rule? Uh, no, I'm not setting anything. What I'm saying is that I was fortunate to be able to work with international organizations to work with people like me internationally. Countries are small, ministries of health are small. And here, your question was, what are we expecting from these organizations? Yes. We are expecting that there will be something for this kind of people to, not just training, but you know, to give them a platform there where they could discuss the problems and how to systemize all these benefits from all these projects that we have. Uh, at hand now, you know, there's a lot there and we have now to put it in the system. Slovenia, my country, was quite good in systemizing uh, preventive services in primary health care. There was a big budget from the health commission given to us to pilot, but now we have systemized. And we had some experience and that is where my question came from to my colleague from Veneto region. Uh, how did you ensure that you know the nurses needed in primary health care were not the ones that are needed at uh, intensive care units, you know, because this was our project and still a problem and still is. You know, these kind of people, these kind of problems uh, demand people who are aware of the system as a whole at the ministry, at the highest level. And this is not political level. And this is very often uh, disregarded. We invest 
more in politicians that come and go than in people working at ministries of health. And this is my message to my colleagues here. Indeed, the sustainability in the ministries is fundamental. Um, Vesna, can I ask you another one, another area that you know a lot as well, which is the area of a skill mix, retraining. You're saying that you realize you are still in the nurses of uh, intensive care to go into uh, prevention. But, but also you have attracted many other professionals, you attracted NGOs, you, you changed the shape of primary health care in, in, in Slovenia and, and you changed the, the skill mix, the training. C can you give us a bit of a reflection? How did you change the skill mix? How did you get primary health care people interested in public health and health promotion? What, what did you do there? Well, basically good projects that are well planned and that have enough resources attract people. So people are very willing to contribute. But then there are also problems. We wanted to introduce kinesiologists, dietitians, psychologists, and then, of course, we are all aware that the budget is one. So people like um, physiotherapists, they were very worried, what will this mean, introducing, for example, kinesiologists for them, you know? Uh, because this will be additional people in the health system that needs to be financed. So whatever you do, you always have to keep in mind the workforce as a whole. And this was also what I said before. It's not through one project. You have to plan holistically. And that is why I'm so eager to repeat and repeat that we need to have someone who is overseeing the project. And this cannot be doctors medical chamber, nurses, but this needs to be someone that is in charge, you know, in charge of the workforce at the highest level. So can we deal with this issue of a scarcity of, of workforce, health workforce, by bringing new professionals? And what kinds of new professionals you brought on board? Somebody said that, you know, workforce is the main pillar. Yes, it is. It's the most costly also. Most of the money goes to the workforce in yeah. health centers. So, Pay attention, you, you have to pay these new people coming into the system. So you have to plan this also with, for, for example, in my country, health insurance. In some other countries, this is a matter of budget, you know. So this, uh, this means investments, investments in people, and this needs to be planned. And if it's not, you know, you have a wonderful project, but then it's gone because there's no money for these people to be employed, or even worse, there are no people. Thank you. I'll go back to you in a minute. I'm sure there'll be many questions from the, from the online and from the room. Uh, Stephanie Walder is the Director General of Health Systems in, in Austria, in the Ministry of Health. Stefan, uh, you've been particularly skillful not only in running the reforms in your country, but in working with these agencies. You've been very skillful about bringing resources, support, networks, the various mechanisms to support your reforms in, in Austria, and I would like to hear much more about that. But let's start with what's your wish list? We got the wish list of Vesna. What's your wish list, uh, Stefan, from uh, these gentlemen here, these organizations? Thank you, Joseph. Welcome also from my side, and, and thanks for starting with the wish list. Actually, it's, it doesn't feel like Christmas. It's really too hot for that, but I, I, I'm, I'm happy to share my wish list. Um, and, and to um, go into the details in, in, in the question of, of health workforce because I, I looked at the previous uh, editions also of the summer school because I also feel that the summer school topics are also always topics that come uh, just like a horizon scanning with, with issues that are burning, right, that we really need to, to look at. And uh, there was a, mud, uh, a lot on, on health security, uh, implementation of, of innovation, digital health, the hospital after COVID, and skill mix. And uh, eventually, all those areas are important for all countries globally, and, and particularly also in the, in the Euro region. And this is um, definitely the case for health workforce. So um, in that regard, I think almost all of the countries share uh, the same challenges, but then also the, the approaches are much more connected than in other areas. So I think there's definitely a role for um, supporting member states then in, in navigating uh, in health uh, workforce policies. I would agree that a lot is here, a lot of evidence, um, a lot of uh, good and best practice, but we definitely uh, fail sometimes or mo mostly in, in implementing, in, in, in scaling up. Uh, in, in the area of health workforce, to, to share maybe two 
uh, interesting anecdotes from, from, from back home. Um, we had one um, older colleague who, when he attended the meeting on skill mix, reminded us on the situation in public administration when it was common that every external communication had to be signed off by a lawyer. And there always was a shortage of lawyers in the public administration. No wonder, because it's the policies that define a lot of the situation. And, and the other um, um, interesting uh, fact is that in Austria we, we have maybe the, the second highest uh, density of physicians, but we always have a shortage or discuss a shortage of physicians within the country. And for that, uh, typically we, we see the tendency, not only in health and not only when it comes to health workforce, that, we are, uh, that there is a demand for simple solutions. And I think the richness of this summer school already showed and also of today's uh, uh, conference and meeting showed, there are no simple solutions. It's so many elements that we need to focus on. And uh, that would be really my, my wish list in adding a comprehensive view and really collecting the different areas because it's not simply training more people. It's not simply paying more. Maybe in some countries it is more relevant, but uh, not, not in, in, in our countries definitely. But it's a, it's a broad range of, of, of activities. And uh, the evidence, there is some evidence but it's not very, very clear, and it's not very clear how to follow this evidence then in really retain and uh, uh, depending on, on the path dependency in our countries. So I think it's really about applying what we know from, from different projects. And the second thing, it's not only being comprehensive, but then being really uh, uh, very pragmatic, the hands-on approach, to really test it, try it, and also evaluate it and share it so that we don't need to redo mistakes and, and, and need to find new routes, but really identify um, ways that uh, work, measures that work, uh, and then uh, to build on those. And I think that I think, I think, I think very much your approach, uh, Stefan, is what we want to do and what we do in the summer school and in the observatory and the commission in general all these organizations which is trying to bring and align all these various strategies. I think uh, when you go into niches, as it, happens, as, it happens, as it happens with microphone that is failing, so um, if you see only partial, uh, partial instruments, partial uh, mechanisms, you really lose, lose the whole point. But that's exactly what I want to get as well now, um, Stefan. Uh, I'm really keen that you guys tell me about <laughs> Hello? Now it works. Thank you. Is it you behind, Matthias? Uh, talking about uh, transformation, I'm really, really keen that we talk. Uh, uh, Marco, Marco Marcella, uh, in the keynote in the opening, made a lot of emphasis on transformation. And I'm particularly keen to hear about the enormous transformation that you did in primary health care with the introduction of the primary health care reform and the enormous complexities of changing uh, the culture, the behavior of uh, general practitioners used to fee-for-service and two, three hours a day to uh, work in primary health care. Can we hear, within the limits of what you can share with us, what kinds of strategies, incentives, communication, politics, Machiavellic, whatever <laughs> you did to, <laughs> to actually get this underway? Definitely. I think, again, I would, start, I would like to start with the situation that we were looking and, and forecasting a shortage of physicians, in particular of GPs in the public uh, uh, service. So we knew that from, every, uh, from 100 students starting medical universities, typically 10 um, would then work later on in the, in the outpatient area as a GP. So the, 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 the first um, question was, and the demand was to simply increase the number of, of, of uh, university students, which definitely is one answer, but it's not uh, the best one because it takes quite long, uh, <laughs> at least 10 years, um, a bit more than 12, 10 years. And also it's really costly because we have so many people then that we don't um, uh, look into why actually are they leaving? Why don't they work in, in that setting? So we started uh, with engaging with uh, young physicians, with uh, other health professions, uh, and it was very clear that actually they wanted to work like in the setting of a hospital with multidisciplinary teams, etc. But 
in the outpatient area, which was not possible before the introduction of the primary health care reform that we tried to push for many years. Um, and the way uh, also there it was fascinating that um, when you discuss it purely on a national level, it's the old patterns that you see uh, coming up again and again. So what we did really was um, uh, teaming up with other countries uh, in the policy dialogue. I think, Matthias, you already uh, raised that one. Uh, in Bled in Slovenia in 2017. We had wonderful experiences from the Veneto region, from Slovenia, not from people from the ministries, but from people really working in the area of primary health care. And also then from the Austrian delegation, we had many um, health professionals, doctors with us to see actually how things um, work in, 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 in other countries. And that really helped in facilitating that reform and uh, to, to manage some of the, of the difficulties, particularly also the question of, 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 of financing, right? Because uh, everybody wants to be unburdened from some of the, of the uh, burden that uh, particularly physicians and our health professionals, nurses face, but then they don't sure. want to lose the income, right? And um, the way we did it was then really to say, kind of in a piloting phase, to start doing it. And we started also to have social workers in the teams in primary health care units. And in the beginning, it was again and again the same, that the primary health care units, the physicians in particular, said, but why shall we have social workers there? What, what could they do for us? Why, why should we work together? And after half a year, we came back and they said, how did we work before that? And how was it possible to even work without social workers in the team? So I think a lot has to be demonstrated that it's working and we have to really start implementing, obviously based on, on, on evidence, but then really get into, into, mm -hmm. into implementing did, it. Did benchmarking work? I remember we did some policy dialogues together, benchmarking the primary health care in Austria with other countries. Yes, definitely. Uh, we, we, I remember this Kringos uh, study where, where Austria was a, was a, had the, the red lantern in a way uh, on the map, which was quite quite a strong message to other um, to all stakeholders and also uh, the persistence of international organisations because obviously it's not rocket science, but all the um, recommendations, be it from the semester process, uh, from the OECD, from uh, policy dialogues with the observatory with WHO strengthen your primary healthcare system and obviously you know that but it's important to then uh, have this kind of benchmarking and particularly seeing well what would be the opportunity cost in the future I think this is something you mentioned already um, this this number from Germany I think it, there, there are drastic numbers from a couple of countries how many people do we actually need in the area of uh, health and social care and it, it will not be sustainable and the other factor is if you look into the PISA survey you see that the interest in specializing in medicine is decreasing in the last five to ten years massively. In, in over half of the OECD countries, it's going down. So we really need to, to, to learn from each other and then to also see with benchmarking how we can cope with the situation because definitely yeah. aging will happen. And the Z generation is not very happy to join the medical profession. It's tough, you don't get enough money, working conditions, and that's fundamental as we're looking for alternatives. We'll be asking our international organizations to help us with that. But, but before I move, so we're hearing about pilots implementing it, we hear about benchmarking, we hear about best practices from your neighbors, we hear about ensuring the same level of income <laughs> and demonstrating that even when they move from fee-for-service to other mechanisms, they still make ends meet. And, and so some of the, the strategies, and also, um, do you split the profession, those who are recalcitrant from those who are more uh, uh, excited? How, how do you work with that? Because there are doctors that never change, you know? Luckily, they do, right? So <laughs> I'm a medical doctor, I can say these things. No, no, definitely. And there is a big demand for changing the way of working together and the, the basis that we have to uh, build by regulating. Uh, but definitely, there, the, well, let's, let's face it, there are people used, who used to work uh, in, in the same situation as a single-handed GP 
for maybe 20, 30 years. And I think it's also, you have to, to really be very clear if that is your target group, who you want to convince to actually change the ways of working. What we had, and I, I like to call it a window of opportunity, but in fact it was, it was uh, many sleepless nights, uh, it's that uh, with the baby boomers retiring, we have the health workforce um, decreasing uh, massively. So we had 50% over a couple of years um, reaching retirement age of the people who had a contract with the social health insurance. So that was a massive, um, and it still is, uh, pressure on the, on the system, but it also gives you um, opportunities to yeah. introduce change. And now we see also uh, other colleagues who want to work in, in, in those team settings. So, so old dogs can never learn new tricks. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. In many other countries, yeah. the strategy has been, uh, indeed, to split the profession, to get the young uh, excited, more incentives, more opportunities, and demonstrate with these pilots to the old dogs that change can happen. Definitely, but there we also saw when we managed to have this mix of some um, uh, colleagues who did the job for a couple of uh, 10 years or so, a couple of years, 10 years, 15 years, with young colleagues. That was the ideal mix, obviously. And then you always find those people who really want to do something different for uh, the next years. Exactly. And I think also we have to acknowledge that you had a lot of investment into your practices. So the question is also how do you uh, deal with that question that is typically not raised uh, very, very um, loud. But it is something that you had, have to have in mind, and also uh, in introducing some network possibilities that are much more difficult, but trying to also address um, the, the question of, of um, medical deserts within the country, maybe with uh, some network um, uh, solutions where people can still work in their own premise, but then having other colleagues joining from time to time from other professions. Uh, I think those are some these rotation. strategies that, that work, some rotation, etc. Because if you, if you manage to get the mix, then it's, it's the ideal situation. It's sustainable. Before I go to our agencies, Vesna, you know an awful lot about transformation. You, you single-handed did a lot of work in bringing public health in primary health care, new professions, uh, nursing, health promotion. Could you tell us a bit more, how did you change that culture? Wasn't easy, was it? Well, Particularly vis-a-vis -vis the doctors. Well, first of all, you never do anything on your own. It's always a mix of people, you know, that are eager to change things because uh, they learn from good practices from abroad. For example, Slovenia was very eager to do what Finland has done years ago with Karelia project and so on. And there were some enthusiastic people in primary health care and public health who worked together and joined forces. But we had, institutionally speaking, 100 years of tradition of primary health care and public care. This is a big difference to Austria, you know, very strong primary health care, very strong public health. So for us, it was easier to, to uh, you know, um, make these two entities work together. But what was crucial was that there was some money there available for piloting, for innovating, and people, you know, are like this, you know, they get around a uh, uh, certain project and they start to understand better each other while doing the project. And this is where international, you know, support is so important. I would refer also to one project that we are doing together with Austria and Belgium with the commission because we realize the countries that when we are lucky enough to have a government who knows what they want to do and they are there for in Slovenia maybe two years or luckily maybe more in some other countries four years you know you have to ensure that they can actually go for it and not being in a position where some mechanisms at the European Union are not available at that precious moment when we have political will. And this is what we were confronting, commission, um, the three countries and our country when we had the presidency in 2001, and other countries agreed. And we said, let's work with the commission a little bit differently. Uh, we want, you know, to approach Commission and say this is what we want to do. For example, primary health care reform. And the Minister approaches the Commissioner and says we want to do this. And then at the Commission, you know, there are so many different mechanisms that could serve and support this reform. 
And here, you know, this has been also done in the project together with you, Observatory, because it was easy for us countries, you know, to relate because we are all partners of Observatory. So what I want to say is it really matters to work internationally at this moment. <coughs> It does matter much more than it did before because there are so many challenges and just going around and talking to others like in this school here, you know, gives you much more insight what can be done and what cannot be done and how. So Perfect. That, is, that is, I think, the point of all this international, international collaboration. Marco, Jim, it couldn't be better for you. I mean, these guys are in love with you, you know, with your work and so on. It's, it's easy today, right, Marco? Marco Marcella is director of the Health uh, Systems Department uh, in the DG Sante. And uh, Marco, and you, Jim, afterwards, can you do a pitch in two minutes and tell us all the wonderful things you're doing? We, those of us that we were in the summer school, had hours hearing, and actually I'm supposed to work with you both very closely, and with Thomas, and I learned a lot, a lot of stuff that you guys are doing, sort of uh, in regulation, technical instruments, best practice, joint actions, it's enormous, it's amazing what you're doing. Can you have two minutes for those who are online about the kinds of things that the Commission is doing in support of these member states? They make it easy for you already because they seem to be extremely positive, which is nice. So I go first. You go first. Va bene. Okay, good. So, but I will take just one minute because then you will get another minute to reply to Vesna because I think that she deserves Do that. the call. Start with okay. a reply. I so, like that. Uh, okay, then I will embed the reply in my intervention. So first of all, what are we doing, especially for workforce or in general, for supporting the member states to achieving their objectives in the context, of course, of a work which is very, you know, driven by the fact that the, the, the Commission does not have certain competences, but rather they are at the member states level. But there are three, uh, three drivers, right? So the first one is that we support cooperation. The second one is that we introduce regulations where we need to introduce regulation. And the third one is that we do financial support. So I will spare the financial support because I want to go back to that point later on. When it comes to cooperation, what do we do? I think that we are covering this beautiful fil rouge that was coming, was coming from the two speakers. The fil rouge that starts with systematizing reform and then uh, systematizing reform in, a, in a situations where we have a very dynamic innovation, which is probably brought uh, by digital, most of it, I, I hear uh, today, and, uh, and which takes us to these needs for partnership and innovation. So if we take that fil rouge, when it comes to cooperation, especially for workforce but beyond, I think we have the first, it is a set of important horizontal activities that are covering, say, the work that we are doing uh, for uh, skills in general, supporting the member states in identifying uh, where, say, the issues are in support of care strategies that is developed, say, among the member states at European level. But we also have, um, say, the, uh, the work that we are doing in, with the migration package, you know, understanding what is at the root of that and then analyzing what we can do, uh, say, with actions, uh, you know, not only at European level, but also facilitating the work that is done bilateral between countries. And, Let's not forget the work that we, that we do when it comes to regulating, say, the professions, and yeah. especially uh, these professions. So we do have these transversal sets of actions that, you know, span across the Gs, you know, Sante, but also colleagues in reform, colleagues in GROW, colleagues in the GRTD. And then there are very specific actions that we fund to support what the community is asking us to support. You know, we go from, say, very direct work on RRF that are serving the purpose of the member states, but we also work in creating consensus and sharing practices. We have done that for skills. We have done that for, say, retention. We are done. Now, what do we do there? We support projects. And now I take this second minutes to also go back to what Vesna was saying. So these projects... You know, if we have a very high level of ambitions on health, you also need to have 
a very high level of ambitions on investing uh, there. Now, the best sharing practices is the first step. I guess that the first step in a sharing practice is try to understand whether there is a common vision, and then from the common vision whether we can devise a set of actions that then can be specialized locally, right? So we do that. And we do it with these projects specifically that are serving the purpose that you mentioned before. Now, one element that I want to raise to this panel discussion, it is that in an analysis of these projects, you know, we are very good in supporting the people in coming up with the best practices, but then Stefan says, ah, but we do have a problem in scaling up. And then Vesna says, ah, but we do have a, positive, a problem in capacity building at the member states cool. level. Yeah. And that, and I close, takes yeah. me to a problem that I hear time to time, which is called political ownership, you know? <laughs> it is one of these words that I now like a lot. So what do I mean by political ownership? When we fund this project, don't forget that these projects don't end at the end of the deliverable 3.5.6.10. It actually ends in the ends of the citizens that will benefit from what they have developed. So I'm more than happy to continue the discussions in pushing and scaling up and addressing the problem of political ownership. I think that's absolutely perfect. I'll go back to you in a minute, but I want to go back to you as well after Jim about the scaling up. It's true, many projects are finished the day that you switch off the website. You have two presentations in two international conferences and we go home and we start applying for the next project. And this is exactly what you're talking about, and this is exactly what I want to hear from you. And it's about transformation, it's about implementation, about the scaling up. So you put the finger very much on the, on the bottom there. But uh, let me ask you another area. I mean, you've been one of the fathers, not the father of the, of the, of the, the U-Health data space. It's, it's, it's been this dream that finally, finally has taken place. And uh, we talk a lot about digital, we'll be talking in the summer school, we're talking about AI. I mean, you are the ideal person to tell us, how, how is the AI going to shape the, the health workforce? I mean, how we know that many professions will disappear and still the universities keep training them as if nothing happened. We know that, I just was reading a colleague of mine, Jorah, was sending me some uh, news for today on uh, AI hospital in China, China where actually there are only uh, virtual AI doctors there and nurses, and he's operating already for training, but for real patients. That's escaping. What do we do with that? We want to regulate here. Are we competitive? There are many, many elements, because you are an European Union, remember? You're not just health. You know, you, you, you know the economy depends on AI and digital as well. Could you give us a sense? You're the best person to to tell us about this relation between AI, digital, and health workforce, and the shape of the health workforce? Well, uh, thank you for... Uh, An easy question. <laughs> no, no, but, but the question is easy. No, I we have thank time. You, but yeah. So, um, let me start with, this, uh, with, with, the, with, the, um, with the uniqueness of <coughs> the European approach, which we are also, uh, in a way, um, Show, showing to the rest of the world, and I'm very happy that our colleagues with WHO are here today, and I'm also very happy that peoples in member states will benefit eventually from that. You know, first of all, this AI, uh, first of all, is not new. Uh, it probably is as old as, um, you know, 40 years. What is, what is really new is the fact that today we do have uh, the capacity of generating things because we have machines that can uh, help us in digesting this huge amount of data. Why do I say that? Because there is no AI without data. So the approach that the European Union is following, at least from the regulatory point of view, is to create regulations that are, let's call them, enabling regulation for innovation. So before a new technology comes to, let's say, the health systems, that technology, because it will be uh, say, relate very much to risks uh, and supporting health, and there is the need to have adoption, you need to have, we, we, we set up in Europe uh, probably this unique regulatory environment which consists of two strands. So the first one is that we regulate how data it is actually, uh, say, accessed by the citizens and by the workforce professionals 
and create the, the, the legislative framework so that we know exactly what we are doing with that data. And you know, that is important because the, if there is no trust in the way in which people deal with their data, you know, the system is going to fail. But in addition to, say, enabling the citizens and healthcare professionals to access their data, we are for the first time regulating also, uh, in a very precise way, by the way, the way in which others can access our data to do research. Now, if you do research, one aspect of that research will be to build AI solutions. And that AI solutions is also regulated, by the way, for the first time in the world because the AI Act will create a, what we call a risk-based management approach. So if there is an AI that will have an effect on people, you address and assess the risk, and if the risk is high, you, you create a set of procedures that you have to fulfill. That includes transparency, that removes the bias, you know, all those that like AI in health, they know what we are talking about here. But let's go specific. I can tell you that there is one activity that we have already launched a couple of years ago, and we covered the full spectrum. We started from research. The idea is to create, for instance, a database that will, use, uh, that will help radiologists, a database of cancer images that we can, say, connect from where they are in Europe. You know, first of all, connecting images, radiological images, is a little bit easier, if I may, than connecting health data. But the reasons why we want to do that is because there is the need for quality data to create quality AI. So if I want an AI that is able to discern a fracture in a bone, regardless of whether this is an adult or a kid, and I'm not making this up, there is a difference, and mm -hmm. you can buy a solution that fits fractures, but they don't work with kids, you need to have a very strong database for to that. To train it. So what we are doing is that we are creating, this is a pilot, an experiment, we create this database with more than 60 million images that are related to cancer. And we are also following, we expect to have, you know, images that are related to longitude, that we follow longitudinal patients. And we open up this in a very secure and data protection driven approach to AI specialists in Europe that will develop technologies that then will come to us. Now, we can do that, but then we also need the adoptions and the scaling up of that technology. Now, these environments, say, for transformations, they do require the follow-up. And the follow-up, it's not about technology, and it's not even about legislation. It's about the way in which people set their minds for culturally to adopt that. You need a change management process, and I hope that we can support the member states. Is there time for change management? I mean, the technology is going to take over. I mean, it will bypass the regulation. We are using the DNA genomics from the United States. Are we telling member states that we no longer need radiologists and probably not dermatologists and probably mm. many other geologists e with this? Are we, are we really providing standards, providing new skills? Because we may regulate it, but it's bypassing. I mean, the exponential growth is enormous. It's 40 years, but in the last year, it's grown exponentially. No, thank you. Very fast. I mean, it's, it's, if, if uh, I think that the story that the AI will replace the radiologist now is an old one, and thanks to Indeed. God, this narrative is gone. But now it's the dermatologist. So everybody, yes, but it will be the same story followed by the radiologists, which they will realize that this will save time, and for, especially in situations where you have to do the second opinion, you can come up with technological solutions that do the triage before it gets to the exactly. radiologist. And this will have an effect on the workforce. Now, the problem that we are seeing in terms of adoptions, and I respond to your question, is that is the workforce, and when we say workforce, we say the old level, ready to support that adoptions with the skills that we need. So I was very pleased to hear today that there, is, there are activities in shaping the curriculum. And you know, this joint partnership with university it is fundamental because if you don't have the base to train your people with these new competences, you will also fail in the adoptions of that technologies. So, you know, in addition to what we are doing at European level, there needs to be a continuum where these activities are done at member states level. And, you know, and any reform will need to embed that solution. So, you know, of course, it's, uh, it's very easy to say, but it is like this. This is a cross-disciplinary 
endeavor. So it cannot be done by the technologies that are coming here to sell you the new AI. It means that this technological change it is done together with the people that one day will adopt it. Sorry. Thank you. Excellent. Sorry to be activist of devil's advocate here. Uh, Jim, uh, your pitch of two minutes, we heard uh, several hours of our WHO colleagues. Where's Tomas Tapata? Maybe wants to come in in, the middle, in in a minute, what the regional office is doing. But now we're moving global. You are Jim Campbell, is the director of the Health Workforce Department in Geneva for WHO. There are many things I'd like to talk to you as well, Jim. One is this initial pitch about what you're doing in this field. And secondly, I want to go outside health, our niche. I want to talk about labor policy, education policy, human capital, finance, all these areas that actually have been teaching me over the years. I learned an awful lot from you in that. But let's start with your pitch about what is WHO for in headquarters? What do you do for a living in the health workforce? <laughs> two minutes. In two minutes, okay. Um, <laughs> You're used to that. <laughs> So uh, the, the, the irony is, and, and sort of the, the, the complexity, World Health Organization, a singular noun, but it's not. It is the member states uh, who make up the representatives. It's the executive board, which Vesna has chaired. It's the World Health Assembly, the decision making. It's six regional offices. Thomas from, from the European region, Benjamin from Paho. PAHO is a separate legal entity. It's established before the World Health Organization, but it is also a regional body of the WHO. Uh, it is then the European Observatory. It is the, the, the office here in Vienna, an office in Barcelona, an office in um, Almaty, Almaty, an office, you know, different offices in Lyon, and an office in Berlin. Um, in terms of the support with member states on different activities. So when you say the World Health Organization, it's complexity, that, especially coming back to your first point, Joseph, about political economy, the power, the incentives, the control mechanisms. It is a complex organization. It's not a producer of health per se. It's not a typical industry. Uh, so then what do we do on workforce? Um, Workforce crisis, and, and the WHO works in six official languages. The European Union 20 something? No, official. Officially, no, but. Official languages, much less. Okay. <laughs> but um, with six official languages. So the, the key point here, again, around political economy, political science, language matters. The words that you use and the translation of those words in member state debates and dialogues matters. So if you talk about workforce crisis, we're always talking about crisis. Um, you know, we've got the, the greatest number of health workers in the world today than we've ever had in the 77 years of the World Health Organization. And yet we still have a crisis. We still have shortage. Uh, shortage against what? What is your shortage? Is Vesna's shortage the same as uh, Marco's work across the European Union shortage? How are you measuring it? What's your metrics? What's your science? And when it comes to workforce, therefore, this is not a health issue. This is a labor issue. It's an education issue. It's a capability issue. It's a competency issue. You know, as, as Vesna said, it, the irony the greatest cost in a health and care system is your labor. But the biggest scarcity is having the workforce scientists, the labor scientists, the labor economists in the Ministry of Health. Instead, we take clinicians <laughs> and retrain them to become workforce managers, generally, in most member states. And these are the contradictions and the ironies that are happening across 194 jurisdictions to come further forward. But on the workforce science, what are we trying to do? The constitution of the WHO makes the case. And, and Marco said the same. How do we ensure health for all, uh, for all populations of all ages, access, equity to that? So therefore, it's supporting member states to make those public policy decisions based on evidence for what will work in what context. And again, that's a scientific construct. 
That's about taking case studies, evidence, through a normative process into that policy dialogue. Uh, but that comes back then to the, the other part of the member states. We're here in Veneto, which is a, a great collaboration, but I see colleagues in, in the room from the Institute of Public Health here in Italy, and the Italian uh, participants will know. You know, Italy with COVID-19 at the forefront of the response, the first European uh, sort of epidemic coming through. Then, immediately afterwards, Italy took the G20 membership and the presidency of the G20. So that first political, Joseph, and it wasn't scientific only, the first political discussions about the global COVID pandemic delivered by member states here in Italy through a G20 process. And so we're working with member states, with regional economic bodies, with international economic bodies to try and make that public policy come together. Give us more examples. I mean, frankly, sometimes the Ministry of Health I mean, they don't even talk even to the medical schools with education. I mean, I was surprised that they in a country whose name I will forget, where I had the ministry talking to the medical schools. And there were two different walls. The medical schools said, well, we are independent. We train whoever we want as many as we want. We don't care about what you need in the health service. They do care, of course, but I mean, in reality, they do their own thing. We're talking about investing on health, on, on health workforce, uh, but as you said, we're not talking with labor. We don't understand the financial incentives. We don't understand the, the human, we are not presenting the human capital element mm -hmm. very well. You've been teaching me all these things, Jim. Could you reflect a bit more, uh, uh, following for the G20 experience, but other experiences at the international, at the national level, to be talking to other sectors. And Marco, the, the commission in itself is the ideal health in all policies, the ideal multi-sectoral uh, organization, because you actually can't talk with other directors to make mm -hmm. the case. But let's hear first on, on your experience. So, and I'm sure you may have come across it already in some of the presentations in the summer school, but looking at this as a labor market, of which there's an education market is the driver into the, 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 the productive employment, the pool, and then looking at the exits come further forward. It's a very simple framework, but it puts education and employment together. But if you look around the world and you look at some of the issues and the shortage discussion, um, the time to act, the, the work that was done by Thomas and with Romania here, leadership in the European region, you look at the demographics of the workforce, the supply, the current stock is not going to meet the demands of the population. So the population need. We saw that, I think, in, um, is it Claudio? In the, 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 the uh, presentation here in the Venetia region, yeah. looking at the demography, looking at the burden of disease, and then the workforce issues. So the, there's not enough stock there. The other issue then is that your people, the, the, it's a fallacy today to believe that if you train a physician or if you train a nurse, if you train a therapist, they will work for 40 years in that given occupation. It doesn't exist anymore. You'll be lucky if you get 10 years service in a public setting at this moment in time with the current generation coming through. Uh, so you've got the biggest crisis is not the aging population, it's the population which becomes disinterested in the profession and the service very rapidly coming through. So then the education sector must be a partner in you know, the, the pool of qualified workers working. At the moment, the incentives are to graduate somebody and you measure your success, the rankings of universities, medical schools, lifetime earnings. Nothing to do with public sector service, nothing to do with lifetime career in a ministry of health. There's no social accountability between the universities, funded by governments, but yeah. increasingly funded out of pocket, and the public policy priorities. So this comes back to a human capital lens. If competence is the asset which creates the issue around lifetime earnings, who is, who is invested in that asset, that intangible asset? And is there a social accountability mechanism to connect that to jobs and work? Um, we need to replenish the pool of qualified workers and recognize that it will exit quicker. And so you've got to overproduce. The future is not AI. The future is going to be AI plus overproduction of health and care workers for the population. 
Perfect. I want to go back. I want to go to you and get lots of comments from you and online. We're still more or less on time. Just very briefly, the code of practice. The, the code of practice, talking about human capital, talking about uh, brain drain. Uh, Doble Joe headquarters, regional office, have worked very hard on this code of practice, trying to go into self-regulation of member states, name and shame, benchmarking. How is that working? What's been the results so far on this code of practice? And, and I've been surprised myself that actually some exporting countries are happy on, on the economic side because of the remittances to export them. So it's, it's quite surprising. Can you give us a short reflection on it? So migration has existed throughout history uh, and highly skilled migration, migration corridors, migration pathways, uh, are, are there within the European Union context, within the European region globally. So we have to recognize that. The code of practice um, came into being, 20, started 20 years ago to, uh, this year, um, around the concern that the Millennium Development Goals would not be met in some of the low and lower middle income countries because of the brain drain. But not just the brain drain, the active recruitment of health workers from low and middle income countries by the European Union, by the OECD and others. So it came into being. It took six years to negotiate a code. Again, the political economy, the political science, yep. vested interest, different opposing opinions uh, on the issues before we got a code. So it's now the code is now 14 years old in practice. And so is it working? Again, what's our science and our measurement to understand? Because if, we, if my interpretation of it working is a reduction in migration, then I would say it hasn't worked. If my interpretation is, do I see better ethical behavior? Do I see the, you talked about the protection of workers, uh, Vesna. If we see the protection of workers who migrate, that's a success. That's part of the code. But it depends what your metric is for success and how you do it. So um, the jury is out, Josep, because everyone has a different perspective. But migration will continue to grow. The economic demand in high-income countries is there. Uh, the burden of disease, the aging population, et cetera, et cetera. The education institutions have not been reformed to produce the quantity necessary. Yeah. And so the market turns to human capital which is available out-of-pocket expenditure. So how, can you compensate? So let's take a, a country X, low and middle income country, allows through regulation the opening of new medical schools and nursing schools run by the private sector using international curricula. Individual X pays for that education. The family's capital yeah. is invested in the, the human capital of yeah. an individual. Is that person free to move and to migrate to any country of their choice? Or is the government able to restrict their license and not allow them to migrate? You've got to come back to human capital through the ages, the political incentives in that. So migration will continue. And it's a tough, it's a tough nut, but yes. Some That's a perfect illustration. I have many questions, but I dominated the questions here today. Mark, I wanted to come to you about the migration in Europe, health workforce issues, many other issues. But I think it's now you that you should bring as many questions as possible. I'll ask you then to reorganize yourselves, uh, organize yourselves to answer these questions. Otherwise, I'll throw them at you. So let's start. Um, do we have another one with a microphone so I, we can move around, please? Thank you, Josep. Um, I just wanted to, I don't have to stand, sorry, <laughs> felt, I felt compelled somehow. Um, I'm grateful that you mentioned the human aspect because I think we don't necessarily need more digitalization. I mean, it's important and it's necessary and it will happen, but we need more humanization of medicine and of the medical profession and of healthcare. So uh, my question and comment is around I don't feel necessarily we need to have over this overproduction and we always focus on doctors and nurses. There is a huge pool of people out there and there is a difference between skills and qualification and we have seen that in our own recruitment for public health. So we have a huge pool of unpaid carers. 
you have a huge pool of allied health professionals, you have a huge pool of volunteers, and you have a huge pool of young people and older people, maybe retire in, in retirement age, who would actually would like to give back, you know, or young people who would like to help. So how are these old people who have the skills in a lot of girls, like carers, but don't have the qualification, and we have a program in Public Health Wales where we recruit them and we train them along the way so they can get in senior positions, but of course it's small. But how are we using, or you using, this huge pool of people out there who, who don't have to train necessarily new professionals out there? Well, we have to train them, but obviously they do exist as well. Indeed, there's this pool that we need to retrain, transfer skills, that reskill, and so on. So please do reflect on that. We'll come back to that in a second. More points, please. Any contributions as well of what you're doing, short and sharp? I mean, some good experience in transformation in your own country? Uh, sorry, Joseph, no, I'll disappoint you in that. But I have a question to, to Jim um, in terms of the international code of uh, recruitment. Uh, finally, we are talking about LMICs here, uh, also in the summer school. And I was wondering, I mean, the, the international code is almost fully concentrated on ethics. And, um, but as you said, it's, it's about the political economy. It's about power and who has power. And to just give you an example, in many of these LMICs, because of austerity measures, because of policies on the ground, there's actually a surplus of uh, public um, health workers. We have unsalaried health workers in Sierra Leone, in Uganda, in, Ga in Ghana, um, in Iraq, and the WHO doesn't say, or the National Code doesn't say anything about these austerity measures, which create surpluses, um, and then will, uh, which are then recruited by high-income countries, who are, as we know, the, the, the major suspects and usually the promoters of these austerity measures. So can I be controversial and say, is WHO going to add it to its portfolio to, to, to go into the political economy to be an advocate for uh, reasonably sound policies on the ground rather than just ethical codes? Excellent. In your parking lot, uh, Jim. Okay, more points, please. You're not going to get away with not speaking. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Lynn from the European University Hospital Alliance. Uh, thank you all for your, uh, your insight. It's very interesting. What we've been uh, thinking as university hospitals is that looking at the demographics, um, the scope to increase the number of people working in healthcare is limited. And um, on the long term, we cannot keep increasing the number of people in healthcare. And uh, we are looking at... Um, what can the role of prevention be to reduce the demand for care? And I was wondering if any of you, it's not been touched upon yet, uh, are also considering that for the transformation of health systems. So a bit on prevention. Uh, on, I have some point there, sorry, first. Thanks. Um, Sally Dyercraft from the Medical School at the Australian National University. My question is also for Jim. Um, thank you for articulating so beautifully some of the challenges that we face in medical education, um, certainly in my country. I wondered if you could comment on how we incentivise universities to understand the social contract and to engage with the social accountability mandate because it's an uphill battle for some of us who work in those spaces. Um, and what are the policy levers that um, could be activated to encourage them to do that? Mm -hmm. well, is the situation in OPS in Pajo similar? Oh my God. <laughs> yes, similar. But I was going to ask my question, by Benjamin Puertas from the Pan American Health Organization based in Washington, DC. Uh, my question is to the two member states, the countries, and it relates to how do you deal with uh, a variety of technical collaboration, cooperation from different agencies, and, and now that you see that more agencies are beginning to work in, uh, in the health-related field. And uh, in my region, sometimes you see uh, competition, and you see uh, agencies that are doing the same and going with the same requests sometimes to the countries, and uh, instead of supporting the countries, we create uh, 
more burden to the countries. So uh, what's the situation in, uh, in Europe and how you perceive, because you were speaking before about uh, how you see cooperation and you mentioned examples, so I think that is a very interesting lesson to learn. There was a movement years ago about coordinating the donors, that because all these donors, particularly in low-income countries, were you know, landing on those countries, offering their services, overlapping with each other, again, prestige and visibility. Uh, is the reception time changing? So what's happening? They're limiting our time? Including the closing. Including the closing. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you see my stuff, there's no respect. What can we have from, uh, uh, who's clapping for that? No Prosecco over there, okay? No Prosecco. And, <laughs> behave yourselves. Uh, online, what do we have from online and then we'll get the final wrap up from our colleagues. Sure, so um, many of the questions have already been touched upon, but one, um, there is a big interest on how you're thinking about mental health of the healthcare workers and its sustainability. That's it? Okay, that's easy. Okay, let me kind of try to allocate, we'll start at this end perhaps. Um, the, the one on prevention, Vesna, really belongs to you. The one on using other skill mix to both of you, and them as well, I'll go back there. And perhaps how do you manage with these agencies all wanting to work with you, how you coordinate them, as we hear from Pajo? Stefan, and any other final comments you want to give? Thank you. Trying to be quick. Uh, maybe starting also with the, because I, that, that was more or less uh, coming from different, um, uh, also during the discussion, questions, the overproduction and then the different pools that exist, right? I, I would... Uh, argue there is an even closer pool that we need to look into, and this is very different in different countries, but we see in Austria also a tendency towards privatization, not in the way of, of so much the services, but then uh, physicians and other health professions not being willing to work in the public sector, but more uh, working in a private sector. And I think this is, at least in our case, the pool that is the closest one, but uh, for, the, for the rest of, of what you said, Definitely looking into strategies and working there with also the, the labor services, etc., in, in dealing with the questions, also making the informal carers and organizing and making the legal base stronger helps a lot because we know that we depend on many of those. And if they also leave, then we, we, we have a problem. But again, I think we really need to be very strategic in analyzing where does the problem come from. If we talk about shortages, it's really, is it really uh, too few people at the university? Is it too few people choosing the uh, specialities that we think are needed based on, on, on uh, all the information that we have? Uh, and then also um, how we work with uh, uh, other people and informal care. Uh, the second question was uh, particularly on the, on the skill mix and on, on, on prevention. And yeah, that's, that's uh, the tricky one again when it comes also to the question of how quickly do we get results. And there, unfortunately, is this tendency in trying to find measures that will produce results immediately, right? So we know that we do not invest as much as, 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 as we need to. And uh, also there, I think it calls for, again, implementing and not doing more research, but really focusing on, on, on getting things to the ground. And then also for the uh, question of different uh, agencies, I can do the quick answer, which is obviously too simple. But we mainly use the observatory to help us in sorting out also uh, the different products of different uh, institutions. Uh, because definitely for us as a small member state country, it, would, it is indeed quite challenging and also quite demanding sometimes to know where to look at. And this is one of the, of the, of the absolute um, added value that we have with an institution like the observatory in making sure to combine. But we need to be better in combining and not competing, definitely. So over, over, drink, over drinks, I'll set up an observatory for you, my free time in, in Latin America. Vesna, you are very much into prevention, you're very much into skill mix, can NGOs, go ahead. You can answer, yeah, exactly. I'll let you, I'll <laughs> let you. Without a lot of introduction. Agencies, it's, we need to understand member states are in charge in the European Commission and in the World Health Organization. So we are the ones that have to request, 
what needs to be done and how. And for example, Slovenia, a very small country, we wanted European Commission to work with observatory when it came to some analytical work because observatory knows our country not to duplicate and we just requested it and got it. That's all. So when the country knows what the country wants, then it's easy. But most of the time, country doesn't know what the country wants, and they come with different proposals and projects and so on. We just jump on all the opportunities, <laughs> not really understanding what we are after. So the problem is with the countries, again, build capacities within the ministries. That's the answer. Prevention. Prevention, Slovenia invested enormously the funding from Europe into preventive services in primary health care. What we understood after 10 years is, fine, there are all these professionals working with people, but who are the people? The people were early retired women who already were seen and doing something for their health. Definitely not vulnerable population, super obese, people in poverty not assessing the services. We did it completely wrong. Again, we asked for money, got it, invested in community approach, invited lay people NGOs, different NGOs, you know, Caritas, Red Cross, youth organized, patients organized, and so on, at community level, to bring in those people that were really in desperate need for preventive services. We cannot prove that this gave us better results in health, but we can prove that those people started to attend those services that are free of charge more than they did before. So this is about the prevention, and then maybe, uh, then maybe, I stop here. <laughs> <laughs> Is the applause because of the stop and the reception? Jim, lots of questions for you, but let me, if, if you could focus, please, on, on this pool of resources out there that, you know, in other countries that, that we could be using, we should be using, and the policy levers question. So and maybe the mental health, because we haven't addressed that one. We've made a huge effort as WHO in the last few years responding to member states the decisions in the assembly. When we talk about the health workforce, the health and care workforce uh, more broadly, including, so it used to be doctors, nurses, and pharmacists maybe, then beyond the licensed occupation into sort of the key, the sort of 10, 15. But you're talking around health, care, public health, social determinants, nutrition, food and safety, uh, medical technology, a new report just published here in Europe uh, 900,000 workers in Europe in the medical technology industry. And where are they generally? They are STEM and health and clinical people now working in biotech, pharmaceutical industries, etc., etc. So the oversupply, the production goes into other industries, not only treatment and diagnostics goes into the bits and pieces. So yes, all of those occupations uh, need to be considered. Then, we, how to maximize their use. So the overproduction is about the overproduction of competencies. Whether that's in family carers, self-care, we have to get people more literate in the understanding. It's not only about the same, more of the same uh, to get them with. The transformation that's needed is looking at advanced practice. The example that we saw here in Veneto, the advanced practice specialized nurses to go into the communities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the issue of social accountability, um, absolutely. Uh, I think it's one of the big issues that we need. I'd uh, love to have a conversation on how Australia can also get engaged in some of these issues. Uh, the examples that we have from member states are that when uh, it tends to be led by universities and deans rather than led by the government. So how to make the shift uh, into a government-regulated government ownership on it. Kind of thing. Code of practice. Uh, I think it was, uh, was your name Goran? Um, President Rufo from Kenya um, has just sacked his whole cabinet. It started this month. I don't know if people followed the news. Sacked his whole cabinet because of the strikes around the whole country and public sector strikes, public protests. One of the dominant issues there was the, the phenomena you're talking about. Unemployed nurses, unemployed physicians, at the same time as there's a shortage of physicians and a shortage of nursing, and that's because of the debt crisis across low and middle income countries today. Uh, the debt crisis with inflation rates post COVID has come in, the more money being spent on debt than on health and education combined, resulting in decisions not to employ doctors, nurses, and things. 
So what do, what, what do you do with that human capital? The president now has reappointed a cabinet, or at least nominated new cabinet members, set up a task force, started last week, how to employ 20,000 unemployed workers. They're still needed in Kenya. Do you facilitate the migration to Europe? Or do question. you facilitate their employment in Kenya? Where's the best dollar? Thank you. That's the perfect uh, dilemma. Marco, I'm giving you the privilege to wrap us up on this session and answer any of the questions. One thing is clear, Marco, you have the regulatory power that uh, none of the other agencies have. And I think we'll be calling a lot upon, if not in this presence, in next presences, for that regulatory power, the training standards, this pool of resources beyond the medical and the nurses to regulate them, to allow that uh, cross-border with the right quality standards and training. as a lot of what you're doing. I mean, some reflections on that and final reflections on the session, please. Well, final reflections because of the bubbles, I guess, that uh, I am sorry, but I am a very strong believer on partnership. And, uh, you know, I work for a, an institution that is called the European Commission under the European Union. So for me, we are working for a community that operates both in agendo, in, uh, for me also in essendo. So I, I believe that if we have to come up with solutions, uh, these are shared uh, solutions, and if we can help in getting there, we will certainly not fail to do so. So I'm looking forward to this in transition period with the new parliament and the new college that will come in, uh, say, over the uh, autumn, after the autumn. And I, if you, um, if in relation to the challenges, I'm pretty sure that some of you have already seen the political priorities of um, uh, Madame von der Leyen presented at the Parliament, where you see both the health part and the social aspects covered by uh, that document. So we will see how this unfolds over the next week. And I'm pretty sure that we will continue working in such a way that everyone benefits. But again, it's a beautiful context. final words. Can you please give, put your hands together in spite of my lousy management here? They've done a great job. Thank you very much. Joseph, thank you so much, and uh, many, many thanks to this fantastic panel. We were planning to do a little bit of a wrap-up, but um, somehow expecting that there was no time for it, I asked uh, Kasha, Thomas, and Antonio just to finish with one line. And please, Kasha, co-director of the summer school, one line. Thank you so much. So I think that solutions are out there. There are many, many, many solutions. And we can uh, change the trajectory from fiery firefighting to more structural approaches. And the common future of it is, as Marco said, collaboration. Thank you so much, Kasia. That's a very positive outlook. And I go now to Thomas. Thomas, can you top this? No. no. <laughs> I think wonderful examples of transformation. And I would like to love to hear from you is the impact in Austria before and after with figures we'll have a chance and in Slovenia. Thank you so much for the examples and, and for Claudio as well on the nursing community was really interesting. Thank you so much. Ooh, real hardcore evidence. You're one of us actually. Antonio, can I ask you also to say um, just a, a sentence to uh, finish up together with me? Una frase molto molto semplice anche da oggi si vede l'importanza di come il livello europeo, il livello nazionale, il livello regionale sono collegati l'uno con l'altro. Tutto si tiene insieme e ciò che anche fino a qualche tempo fa poteva sembrare distante come le decisioni che venivano prese a, eh, a Bruxelles, però grazie anche a questo periodo straordinario che in tutta Europa stiamo vivendo e eh, in Italia in particolare con il eh, PNRR, vediamo come tutte le azioni e tutte le politiche si tengono assieme dal livello europeo, a livello nazionale e a livello regionale e quindi la grande capacità di riuscire a fare sinergie insieme e in collaborazione. Grazie ancora a tutti. Thank you so much Antonio and if I follow you correctly it sounds like the health workforce crisis is bringing us together even more closely working together on these issues and learning from each other. Thank you so much and please enjoy your drinks and your light refreshments.